Well, our next speaker has uh, been a presence at this symposium for many years and uh, back again this year and we're happy to have him and albeit in a very different role. Jim Bridenstine was sworn in as NASA's 13th administrator on April 23rd, 2018, just days after last year's symposium, which he attended then as a congressman from Oklahoma and represented that district in the House uh, of Representatives from 2012 to 2018, serving on the Armed Services and the Science, Space, and Technology Committees. Mr. Bridenstine spoke in these roles at the 32nd and 32nd, I'm sorry, 32nd and 33rd space symposiums. Administrator Bridenstine served in the United States Navy, flying the E-2C Hawkeye in combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has more than 1,900 flight hours and 333 carrier arrested landings. And it's always good to have that number equal the number of takeoffs. He also flew missions in Central and South America in support of America's war on drugs. Most recently, he transitioned to the 137th Special Operations Wing of the Oklahoma National Guard. He graduated from Rice University and earned his MBA at Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Ignition sequence start. All engines are running. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictator is out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. One small step for man. And left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. The dawn of it's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. So many in this room are familiar that we've been given now a new charge. That we are going to place humans on the surface of the moon in five years. That deserves a round of applause, by the way. <laughs> by direction of the President of the United States, the Vice President gave a speech at the National Space Council that I think was one of the most historic speeches in space history. He said, the next American man and the first woman ever will be Americans on the surface of the moon within five years. 
The first woman will be an American on the surface of the moon in five years. That is an extreme declaration and a charge that we are going to live up to at NASA. Yes. So in a few short weeks, I'm going to be in a town in western Oklahoma called Weatherford. This is a town where General Tom Stafford was born and raised. It's a town where there is a, a very impressive museum dedicated to the Apollo program. And General Tom Stafford has invited me uh, to really go out to that museum and celebrate the Apollo 10 mission. And I want to anchor for a second on what Apollo 10 was and about this gentleman, Tom Stafford, who we're going to celebrate today with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Tom Stafford was with a great crew, it included Gene Cernan and John Young, and they launched to the moon on Apollo 10 for the first time to actually do, um, we would call it a dress rehearsal for the Apollo 11 mission. So they didn't land on the moon, but they went down to within about eight kilometers of the surface of the moon. It was the first time that we had somebody flying solo in orbit around the moon. It was the first time we separated the lander and had it actually go down almost to the surface of the moon. And if you talk to Gene Cernan, who I had the opportunity to, to speak with before he died when I was a member of Congress, and Gene Cernan was, was an, an amazing individual with um, flair all the way up until the end. He was always advocating for a return to the moon ever since he left the moon for the last time uh, since, I guess, 1972. But Gene Cernan, has said, and I don't know if it's true, maybe some of the engineers at NASA will disagree, but he said they light-loaded that lunar module for a very specific reason. They were afraid that Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan would actually land on the surface of the moon if it had enough fuel to, no kidding, go to the surface and come back off. <laughs> now the engineers will say, well, we wanted to make sure we replicated the right amount of fuel had they landed and taken off, that they'd have the right amount of fuel when they docked to the command and service module. Uh, that's what the engineers will tell you. What they will tell you, what I would say Gene Cernan will tell you, is that ultimately they didn't want them to land on the surface of the moon, and knowing Gene Cernan, they believed that might be in the realm of possibility. <laughs> so they went down to about eight kilometers off the surface of the moon, and then they separated from the descent module. They went down to that point where the descent module would, would ultimately begin uh, a powered descent to the surface, and at that point they aborted. There was maybe a mistake made, and that abort ultimately got replicated by maybe two different people in that, in, that, in that lunar module. And because of that, the abort actually got disengaged. And the lunar module started rolling. And Gene Cernan would say that he saw the horizon of the moon eight times, and if it would have gone on for just a few more seconds, we would have lost that crew as it would have impacted the surface of the moon. Tom Stafford took control manually got control of the vehicle, and they had a successful rendezvous with the command and service module. And we're going to have the opportunity to honor Tom Stafford at lunch today, and I'm very thrilled about that. I will also tell you that there was a, a moment in history made there where maybe some expletives were mentioned from the moon, and of course NASA took heat for that. Gene Cernan's expletives were clear. Tom Stafford's were in Oklahoman, so nobody really understood him. <laughs> but had I been alive, I would have understood him very clearly being in Oklahoma myself. Uh, so this was an amazing moment. Now, when they came home, they actually broke another world record that is held even today. The fastest human beings ever in the history of the world. 39,900 kilometers per hour. What an amazing achievement. Now, I will tell you, 39,900 kilometers... I guess, Tom Stafford, I guess you couldn't put together an extra 100 kilometers per hour. I mean, 40,000 would have been a nice achievement. Had Gene Cernan been the commander, maybe that would have been done. <laughs> I kid Tom Stafford. He's a fellow Oklahoman. I can do this. So I will tell you there was, a, there was uh, another record made at that time. That record was they became the furthest astronauts, the, fur the, the, the people who have gone the furthest from home ever and that record still stands today. Why are these achievements important? They're important because it brought us to that day that we're gonna be celebrating here in a couple of months 
where we had astronauts landing on the surface of the moon. And I will tell you as the NASA administrator, everybody who is old enough remembers exactly where they were when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the surface of the moon. That moment is emblazoned in people's minds like nothing in history. And I can tell you this as well. I've heard General Hyten give talks about those moments. He followed the space program with great enthusiasm. And because of that, he is now, of course, a critical capability for our country. The question we have to answer is this. In the last 50 years, how many General Heightens have we missed out on because we haven't continued to do these very stunning achievements? That's what NASA is all about. It's about creating that next generation scientist, technologist, engineer, and mathematician. It's about putting America in the lead when it comes to these astonishing achievements. Now, I was not alive when these events took place. I'm the first NASA administrator in history that wasn't alive when these events took place. I will tell you what my memories are. And, and, and my generation, this generation, we have memories ourselves. I remember in fifth grade, Mrs. Powers walking into language arts class with tears rolling down her face. And I remember Mrs. Powers, everybody's like, what's wrong with her? There's, th this is what, what's going on. And I remember all the teachers huddling together to discuss what just happened. And I remember them rolling the televisions in and turning on the TV and we watched over and over again as the Challenger came apart. And of course the teachers were keenly interested in this because of Krista McAuliffe who also is an American hero. And when we think about the days that came after that, we got a return to flight, amazing capabilities that we had with the space shuttle. There's another thing my generation remembers. I, was, I know exactly where I was. I was in the Persian Gulf on the USS Abraham Lincoln in early February when Commander Fadok came in to our ready room and talked about the Columbia that just came apart. And of course, we turned on CNN and the ready room on the aircraft carrier. These are images that my generation remembers. And these are the images that my generation needs to change. We need to go back to the moon. We need to do those stunning achievements. We need to have people emblazon in their minds those moments of history that are of greatness and not of tragedy. And that's what NASA intends to do. And that's why this moment that was announced by the Vice President of the National Space Council is so important. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to accelerate our return to the moon. You don't know how many times as a NASA administrator I've heard people say, is this Lucy in the football again? We've had the vision for space exploration. We've had the space exploration initiative. And in each of these cases, the timelines were sufficiently long that political winds changed and ultimately the programs got canceled. Well, friends, now we have an opportunity to accelerate it. And this reduces the risk of the Lucy and the football moment. So people have asked me, OK, Jim, what's the plan? How are we going to do this? Well, know this. Nothing has changed from Space Policy Directive 1. In February of last year, the Vice President or the President signed Space Policy Directive 1. The direction was to go to the moon, a lunar return. But it was different than anything we've ever done before. This is not the recreation of Apollo. This is a sustainable return to the moon, where we can go back and forth to the moon with landers and rovers and robots and humans. We can have access to the entirety of the moon. Anytime we want, anywhere we want, we can get to the surface of the moon. That is the sustainable return to the moon. Jan Werner, who I see quite frequently these days, the head of the European Space Agency, says, don't talk about return to the moon. We're going forward to the moon. And absolutely, I agree with him. We're going forward to the moon. We're going sustainably. We're going with commercial partners, which was in Space Policy Directive 1. And we're going with international partners. We're going to retire risk, prove capability, prove technology, ultimately, this is a new direction for the United States of America. We're going to utilize the resources of the moon. The hundreds of millions of tons of water ice that were discovered in 2008 and 2009, available for us to use. Life support, water to drink, air to breathe, but also rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. Hundreds of millions of tons on the surface of the moon. We're going to utilize the resources of the moon. We're going to retire risk, and then we're going to go on to Mars. 
So we had those plans from Space Policy Directive 1. We've been working on those plans since February of last year, and, and we delivered ultimately a plan to put humans on the surface of the moon in 2028. And of course, the president has said he wants 2024. The vice president has declared that's our policy. And I'll tell you this, NASA is up to achieving it. The question is, and everybody here is interested, how are you going to do that? Well, I'll tell you. All of those elements that were necessary to getting humans to the surface of the moon in 2028, all of those elements are, still exist. The plan is still the same, but those things that we were going to invest in in 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, we're going to move them up. So the architecture hasn't changed. The plans haven't changed. This is going to require an amendment to the budget request, and we're working on that at NASA right now. So we think about what needs to be done. Well, number one, we need to get EM1 off the ground in 2020. And we are committed to making that happen. Now, that's going to be a, a test of an uncrewed Orion crew capsule with a European service module around the moon. And we need to make that happen in 2020. And then as soon as possible thereafter, we need to get EM2 off the ground with crew. We need to test all of the life support systems of this vehicle and test the ability of it to operate in orbit around the Earth, do a free return trajectory around the moon, and we need to get EM2 done as soon as possible. And then what's next in the architecture? Well, we need to accelerate or keep moving forward very rapidly, as we have been, on what we call gateway. The first elements of gateway, the first elements of gateway are focused exclusively on getting humans to the surface of the moon. So we need a power and propulsion element. We talk about the gateway. We talk about a reusable command and service module. We need that power and propulsion element. We need that habitation module. And ultimately, that's going to be our reusable command and service module to get humans to the surface of the moon as soon as possible. And we need to focus like a laser right now on ultimately a transfer vehicle to get to low lunar, a descent module, and an ascent module. We have done a BAA earlier for the, the transfer vehicle and, and the descent module. And as of yesterday, in a matter of seven days, I, I heard the Secretary of the Air Force talking about acquisition reform. We got a BAA out. We have a synopsis out for a BAA. We got it out in seven days. And I will tell you, we could have had it out in four days, but I put the brakes on it because I wanted to make sure we were in, in heading the right direction as it relates to my bosses. And we were. So that is out on the street as of yesterday. We're going to have a commercial partnership, a public-private partnership for an ascent module, for the transfer vehicle, and the descent module, all of those elements that get humans to the surface of the moon in 2024. And this agency, NASA, has gone exceptionally fast to get those out on the street. And I know there's a lot of people here that are thinking, oh my, I got to get back to work so I can respond to these things. And we want you to do that. So get to work. Just not, not while I'm speaking. <laughs> so these, are, I think, are important, important, um, important things that we're doing. So ultimately, what I'm talking about there, when we talk about going to the moon, we've now divided it into two phases. The first phase is speed. We want to get those boots on the moon as soon as possible. We don't want to take away anything from getting those boots on the moon. Anything that is a distraction from making that happen, we're getting rid of. And when we do CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, which was one of my first initiatives as the NASA administrator, we're going to put small payloads on the surface of the moon by buying access commercially. We're going to have payloads. We have 10-pound, you know, 15-pound payloads. We need to get scientific instruments to the surface of the moon. We want to buy it commercially, and we're moving out on that fast. Now what we're doing is we're saying we're focusing those capabilities on, on projects and science that helps us get humans to the surface of the moon to the most valuable places on the surface of the moon as soon as possible. So that's important as well. And we're looking at reorganizing NASA. We've talked about a new mission directorate that focuses on moon to Mars. There's operations, and then there's development. We talk about operations. We talk about the International Space Station. We talk about commercial crew, commercial resupply. When we talk about development, these are things that have never existed before. And it's, kind of, it's a very different kind of thing to build something and have to invent things in order to achieve accomplishments than to continue to sustain operations. So we're looking at a new mission directorate. Development is not a mission directorate. It's not a mission. <laughs> so we call it the Moon to Mars 
Mission Directorate. And we are organizing NASA in order to achieve humans to the surface of the moon as soon as possible. Phase one, this is key, phase one, humans to the surface of the moon as soon as possible. Phase two, sustainability by 2028. This is another important capability. It is why the gateway is so important. The gateway is our ability to go to the moon fast, for sure. We want to make sure we're using things that already exist or things that almost already exist so we can get there soonest. But when it comes to sustainability, having a reusable command and service module, we need reusable everything. We need reusable landers. We need reusable tugs. We need reusable launch. And I heard people say, oh, SLS is not reusable. Well, you're right, it's, it's not reusable. What it does is it enables, us to, it enables us to put the up mass into space that is necessary for reusability. That's a key capability. It's a key enabler and it's a key strategic capability for this country. We will be the only country on the planet with this lift capability. And that's important for us. And so we intend to move out on that very, very rapidly. But part of the sustainability is that near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon where we have the, you know, the thermal effects that are benign. We have constant communications with the Earth. We have the ability to abort from the surface of the moon up to that habitation module that's in orbit around the moon. And we have access because of the power and propulsion element of, of, the, of the gateway. We have more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. Al Warden is in the front row. What an amazing achievement all of those Apollo missions were. It took until 2008 and 2009 that we knew that there was hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon. What Gateway is gonna enable us to do is get more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. We're gonna be able to get wherever we need to go when we need to get there. At the same time, we're gonna have commercial lunar payload services going to the surface of the moon when and where we need to get there. So we're building capability, we're building an architecture that ultimately is sustainable for the long run. That's ultimately, so part one, phase one, humans to the surface of the moon as soon as possible. Phase two, sustainability, reusability, more access to more parts of the moon than ever before, a sustainable human presence at the moon. And friends, all of this was already in the plan for 2028. We're just gonna accelerate pieces of it. The next step, of course, is why do we go to the moon? Why is that so important? Well, because we're keeping our eyes on the horizon. The moon is a proving ground. It's the best place for us to live and work on another world so that we can ultimately go to Mars. And as we stand here, as I stand here right now, I mean, I've been the NASA administrator for a year and amazing discoveries have happened in that year. One, we now know that there's complex organic compounds on the surface of, of Mars. That doesn't guarantee there's life on Mars, that the probability just went up. Organic compounds do not exist on the moon, but they exist on Mars. We know that the methane cycles on Mars are perfectly commensurate with the seasons of Mars. Doesn't guarantee life, but the probability just went up again. We now know that there's liquid water 12 kilometers below the surface of Mars. All of these discoveries just in the last year since I've been the NASA administrator. Amazing discoveries. So what is NASA doing? Well, we have the Mars Curiosity rover on, the, on Mars right now, and of course, these discoveries, many of them have been made by this rover and of course, others, its predecessors. And we're focused right now on achieving a Mars 2020 landing. I know John Culberson is here. He shook my hand just a few minutes ago. We are putting a helicopter on the Mars 2020 lander because of John Culberson. I don't know where is John Culberson, if you'll stand up. For the first time, we're going we're gonna to send a helicopter to another world. That's congressional leadership, and I just want to make sure I thank him. I don't, I don't know if he's here. He might have he heard that Bridenstine was talking, so he's getting out of Dodge. But here's the important thing. We're going to send a Mars helicopter. We're going to learn how to, how to create oxygen out of the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars. And ultimately, we're going to do everything we can to increase our knowledge of whether or not life exists on another world, because I think that will be transformational for our little agency called NASA. But Mars 2020 is just the beginning. It's gonna cache samples, and we are focused in this budget request, we're focused on getting those samples home. 
a Mars return mission. Again, we want to get those samples, bring them home, and make assessments as to whether or not we believe life could exist on this other world. Here's what we know about Earth. Anywhere there's water on Earth, there's life. Liquid water, there's life. Well, now we know there's liquid water on Mars. Again, I'm not saying that there's life. I don't know. Nobody else does either. But hang it, I think our agency ought to find out. And we intend to do that. So really, that's what this is all about. People say, why are you accelerating the mission to the moon? Well, because it accelerates our mission to Mars. We're capturing the imagination of the American public. We're ultimately going to find that next John Hyten, and we're going to inspire that next career professional that enables our country to continue to achieve the stunning things that our country has always achieved. And as I talk about the United States of America, I want to anchor for a second on our international partners, because this is an important capability for our country. Last night, we, uh, we had a bowling tournament. It was the first intergalactic bowling tournament with all the heads of agencies from around the world. I don't know how many people were there, 30 plus, uh, and it was, it, was, it was great. Out of my first five rolls, I think I hit three gutter balls. And of course, I'm like, America the whole way, gutter ball, gutter ball, America. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna, turn, I'm gonna turn to my deputy administrator, Jim Moorhard, who's here, and I'm gonna make sure he's not getting gutter balls the way the administrator's getting. He's getting gutter balls too, dang it. Where do I go next? I see Gersten Meyer, he's a couple of lanes over. Gersten Meyer's got his calculator out, he's writing some equations down. <laughs> I'm looking over at his paper, force equals mass times acceleration. He's like drawing projectiles, trying to figure out the velocity and impact in order to knock all these pins over. And I watch him step up to the plate and it goes right into the gutter. <laughs> America. <laughs> Here's the thing, I'm looking at all the other players out there and I'm like, dang it, what, we gotta do something about this. I'm looking at the board. I got all these gutter balls and of the eight people in my lane, I'm in third. There is an inverse correlation between space capability and bowling prowess. <laughs> and that is, that is scientifically now proven by NASA. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> I kid, we had a lot of fun last night and thank all of our international partners for playing. We go into all these meetings, a lot of formal direction. Uh, we're heading, we are very aligned in our efforts to get to to get to the moon and on to Mars. A lot of excitement from all of our international partners and thank you for all of your support on the International Space Station and everything we're gonna do together in the future. Know this, the new direction of putting humans on the moon in 2024 is not an America alone effort. We need all of our international partners. In fact, none of us can do what we want to achieve alone. And all of those activities that we had built up for our 2028 moon landing with our international partners, they all continue. So for all of our partners in the room, and I heard a lot about it last night as we were bowling, know this, we st this is all about leadership. And when I say leadership, I'm not talking about the United States of America, I'm talking about leadership with all of our international partners. And we can do this, and we need your help. Now I'll tell you, we're gonna be going back to Congress with an increased budget request. And to achieve this objective, if we could maybe ask our international partners to step up a little more, it'd be great as well. But it's also true that the partnership needs to grow. There are now more space agencies on the surface of the planet than ever before. And I was learning that there were new space agencies last night as we were bowling. And by the way, some of them maybe don't have a whole lot of capability yet because maybe they're less than a year old, but they can sure bowl a lot better than I can. So this is a great opportunity for diplomacy. It's a great opportunity for leadership. It's a great opportunity to achieve things that have never been done before. And so when the vice president comes before the National Space Council and he gives us this direction that we're gonna put humans on the surface of the moon in 2024, know this. And by the way, the first lady on the surface of the moon in 2024, know this. Our agency is up for it. This is something we can achieve. And it's something that I know, <laughs> I remember walking out of that meeting and, uh, and, and uh, Tom Kremens was there. And Tom Kremens, he's, I was like, well, that's, that's, a big, that's a big audacious goal. What do you think, Tom? And he, he looks at me and he says, we have people. We have people. 
We do have people. And I'll tell you, this agency has amazing people. And they're already putting together the plans and the capabilities to, to, achieve, to achieve this end state. As we think about sustainability up to 2028 and beyond, I don't want to dismiss the importance of the International Space Station. I don't want to dismiss the importance of the Science Mission Directorate of NASA. Our agency has a history of ultimately cannibalizing some programs to the advantage of the other programs. And I made this an issue on the National Space Council when the, president, when the Vice President gave his direction. And I was very clear, it doesn't work. Politically, we cannot achieve the end state. And the Vice President was clear, we need to achieve this by any means necessary. He said it twice, I repeated it. He also said, the, the, uh, the mission matters more than the means. He said that twice, he looked right at me when he was saying it. We can achieve this, but politically, we're gonna have some challenges ahead. We have a budget request that's ultimately gonna come up, and when we think about 2020, we could end up in a CR. That makes things very difficult. We're gonna have, we're gonna have to have an anomaly in the CR for NASA if we're gonna achieve this end state. What does that mean? That means we have to have bipartisan support. We can't ultimately achieve what we're trying to get done unless it is an all of America approach. And all of America will benefit when we, when we ultimately achieve this, this end state. By the way, part of the sustainability we're commercializing low Earth orbit. The International Space Station has been a great proving ground for commercial capabilities. It continues to be that. We're very excited about commercial resupply being successful. Now commercial crew we saw as the Crew Dragon dropped, docked to the International Space Station. Amazing capability. And I want to just dime out. I saw Mike Griffin here. That was his vision 10 years ago. Followed through by General Charlie Bolden followed through by Robert Lightfoot, and ultimately it happened on my watch. That's the kind of long-term effort that ultimately NASA needs, and why we can't get cast to and fro by the political whims of the day, and why we need strong bipartisan support, and we need to work to not cannibalize one part of the agency for another part of, of the agency as we're achieving these end states. So know this, NASA is committed. NASA has the people to achieve it. And when it is accomplished, it will be an all of the United States accomplishment. And I am so grateful for all that we're about to do at this little agency we call NASA. Thank you so much.